so my name is Sherry Colorzone. Uh, some of you may know I work for the City of Regina, but um, I'm not here as the City of Regina representative or anything like that. I'm just here because I know a bit about the city, and I wanted to share that through through this uh, through this session. Um, so it, I've been at the city for for 11 years, and often I hear this: Why doesn't the city? do this or why doesn't the city or why isn't the city doing this or that and you know I understand that there's some frustration but I have I often have the urge to say like well I don't know like what are you doing you know like what um, what do you want to see happen and, and why do you why don't you think you want, you should be part of that and so I often say to people storm the castle you know <laughs> get get up to the doors get up to the fence and 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 have your say and, and do something about it. So if you're a fan of the Princess Bride, you know yes. there's a, a great little um, a great little scene in there where Wesley goes off to save his Princess Bride and, and uh, he gets some encouragement, you know, and, and off they go and have fun storming the castle and, you know, think they can do it. Oh, it'll take a miracle, right? So uh, basically, off he goes, right? And and this is what I suggest to people, you know, off you go. Try to try to make change. Uh, and one of the first things that you need to do when you want to um, approach the city or, or storm the castle, so to speak, is this thing that, that Chris just mentioned, number one on our list. Expand or increase your understanding. A great way to start is Regina's new official community plan. Okay, this was just approved last year, it's called Design Regina, and it's really, it's quite long, but it's actually <laughs> not a hard read. Like, you should have seen what we had before, it wasn't good. Okay, um, and, and other things, right? So the official community plan, things like the comprehensive housing strategy, the transportation master plan, which is in draft, but still, getting to know these types of documents, the zoning bylaw, the traffic bylaw, those kinds of things, especially when you're interested in a particular initiative, you want to get knowing those things um, and right in official, the official community plan there's a section in there about community engagement right and someone last last week or last month at, at Urbanity 101 said uh, it mentioned section 14.7 which reads support creative solutions that may challenge conventional practices to achieve the goals and policies of this plan so that along with this section about community engagement Designer John is basically begging you to get involved, right? <laughs> so you sit down, you read Designer John, some other documents, what next? You can call the city, right? And it seems like just like a, oh, why didn't I think of that, right? Um, there's also an online request form, and ask those specific questions about what the city's doing about the things that you're interested in, right? Maybe there are things happening that you just didn't know about, or maybe there's nothing happening and someone needs to know that people out in the community are interested. So um, when you call or do an online request form, you, uh, there's a thing called a service request that's formed and it goes to city staff, city administration. And they, we, we, they have to respond to it. And so, you know, you have to get an, and you're, you will get an answer. And that's sometimes the very beginning of a conversation. Um, also, next thing is call your counselor, right? These people are here this. to represent you in your ward, right? This is on the website. Uh, there's a ward map, so if you don't know who your counselor is, go check it out. But remember that counselors are people too, right? Call with specific questions about the things that you want to speak to. Um, and this goes back to number three and number nine, right? Thoughtful conversation, about instigating thoughtful conversation and of course that political engagement. And I was kind of thinking about this and I thought, well, you know, people don't call their credit card company to complain about sort of the economic system, you know, in Canada. No, you call because there's a specific issue on your, on your statement or something like that. And that's, I think, how you should approach your you're talking to your city councillor with something specific in mind, not just sort of to ramble on about what you think is wrong with Regina. Because they would appreciate that, I think. So, um, other ways to engage. Uh, going to committee, 
we're going to a council meeting. On the City of Regina website, you probably can't read that. There is a tab on the side here that says City Council and Committees. And it gives you information on how to appear, learning about the committees, learning about the Office of the City Clerk, Council, and then there's meeting <coughs> calendar, agendas, that sort of thing. Um, and, and educate yourself on what is what we call the governance structure, which is just a fancy name for the hierarchy of committees and council and that sort of thing. Okay, um, so um, most reports, um, most stuff that the city is involved in um, is introduced, and I could be wrong about this, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not like super smart about these things, but um, they, they, uh, they go to committees of council. And all of these committee meetings are public meetings, um, except for executive, <coughs> which, yeah. Uh, and, and you don't need to be very prepared to go to, uh, to council. So, um, so, you know, those are all listed on the website, and you can present to committee. Um, it's pretty easy. You just find out when the date is. You go via delegation. Uh, you don't need a written brief. Then you can also uh, present at council. Uh, you need to be a little more prepared for that. Uh, and you actually need to, uh, there's a bit of a glitch in the system right now. You have to know that the reports are coming to council from a committee so that you can prepare to be a delegation. So unfortunately, there's, that's a bit of a glitch. And uh, maybe that could be one of the things that, uh, that people do is maybe like give a call to service Regina and say, hey, I noticed this is a bit of a problem. Check it out and just get, that, get maybe city council noticing that. Um, and so there, some ideas, bringing out some of these ways of engaging. Call your city, call the city, call your councillor, go to, to some of the meetings, show up at the meetings, find out what some of the agenda items are, and, and be part of that process. And, um, you know, uh, if you're a Princess Bride fan, there's 10 things you need to know. And of course, number one is have fun storming the castle. I'm sure you can't hear me at the back, so I'll just talk gibberish and yell. Oh, you, I, you can. That's not good for me then. Uh, yeah, I'm John Klein. I'm the president of Regina Car Share Co-op. You may not have heard of us before. We're a small co-op still, about 40 members, but we've been around since 2008. And here's how we began. For me, it started with an email. I was just starting working at the University of Regina and a coworker sent out to the events email list that there was a way for me to not have to own a car but still get to use one. And I read this email and I was very excited because it was a uh, potluck supper and I like to go and meet people and have good food. And it happened to be a, a potluck supper at Sean Fraser's house uh, well before he was a counselor. And there was a title. So here's a possible way you can get people interested in one of your activities. Email them. Or nowadays, like in modern times, we Facebook or Twitter people. Snapchat. Snapchat people. <laughs> and going there, I found and met a lot of people that, uh, a few that I knew and, and a few that I didn't know. And I ended up uh, becoming uh, volunteer coworkers with them. Uh, over the next years uh, because we ended up deciding that the way to make a car share happen in Regina was to form a cooperative. A lot of other car shares in the country had uh, formed cooperatives and we figured uh, let's copy their model, borrow parts of their bylaws and uh, submit them to the corporation's branch and we'd have an incorporated company here in the, in the city that we could all rally around and use to make uh, car sharing happen. Overall, we, of course, we wanted to fight climate change, and that was the, uh, the, uh, the push behind what we were doing. The cars are pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, over the years, we met uh, resistance, of course. Uh, 2008 uh, happened, the financial crisis, and all of our uh, 
corporate uh, sponsorship submission sort of fell flat. And we had uh, some government money, but it wasn't allowed to be spent on capital, and what we needed was cars, which were capital. Uh, and we had a, we managed to get a website at least, so we were <laughs> on our way. Uh, of course, some of the Regina culture uh, too, it doesn't help, is that everybody likes their cars, about uh, eight and 10 drive. So we have been pushing against that culture and, and showing people that it is possible to do car sharing in Regina. And the um, existence of the car share uh, co-op gave us some opportunities. We got to participate in uh, extra government um, uh, presentations like the uh, Office of Climate Change announcement uh, many years ago. Uh, Design Regina's uh, OCP, of course, uh, it's already been brought up. And we had a citizen circle and participated plenty in that to help shape the official community plan of the city. <laughs> and there you actually can do it. You can have car sharing in Regina. Not many people expect that, I think. Like stretch break or <laughs> okay. All right. um, hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Bear. I'm an urban planner and I've worked in public, private, and the nonprofit sector. So the three projects I'm going to present to you today are work that I did when I worked in the nonprofit sector outside of Regina. And they're small initiatives, but I think they had great impacts on the cities and they could be scaled to a city of any size. You'll see I'm presenting cities both larger and smaller than Regina. So the first uh, project I'm going to talk about is the, the community garden movement in New York City, which started in the 60s and 70s after several decades of decline and disinvestment in the city. And at that time, you had um, property owners who were walking away from the property, um, arson, you know, so we had lots of abandoned lots being left, particularly in underserved neighborhoods. Um, these all fell into the hands of the city, and neighborhoods started taking, communities started taking back these lots and creating these beautiful green spaces, community gardens. In the late 1970s, the municipal government recognized what this was contributing to neighborhoods, and so they actually found a way to formalize the use of these spaces and gave citizens <coughs> temporary leases on city-owned lots so that they could create garden spaces. Um, fast forward to the 1990s, uh, you know, movements in, in urbanism had picked up, uh, New York City was growing, private development was being attracted by the current city administration. So in the mid-1990s and the late 1990s, the administration in place at that time, Rudy Giuliani, was interested in attracting private development. And he realized that he had, at this point, some 700 garden lots um, that had been given temporary leases that, were, in fact, were quite viable for development. So lots started to be optioned off for private development. What happened as a result of that was that a, a movement towards preservation actually began to, um, around these issues. What you had is a number of different nonprofit organizations that um, grew, some large, some small. You had um, large national organizations like Trust for Public Land and very small community organizations that were all pushing towards the preservation of community gardens. And they were doing so in a, in a variety of ways. Very typical marches on city halls, delegations at planning commission and city council. But they were also doing it in a more innovative way. So what you see here is a day-long pageant that happened once a year. It was a theatrical event with puppets and music, spoken word performance that went through the streets of one particular neighborhood in Manhattan and visited 50 different gardens. As you can imagine, because of the sheer theatrics of it, it attracted thousands of participants and audience and also a lot of media attention as well. Um, what came out of that as the sort of movement grew is a number of small successes that contributed overall to saving about half of the gardens, so about 300 of the total. In the late 1990s, Trust for Public Land and another organization were able to garner enough public private investment to create a land trust that was essentially a scattered site land trust that preserved about 100 gardens um, in perpetuity. A few years later, um, another 198 gardens were preserved through a member of understanding by Mayor Bloomberg, realizing um, that these gardens had actually contributed to the livelihood of these neighborhoods. Um, and current processes are still going on to try to preserve these gardens. A lot of what had happened was that these gardens had never been formally designated, so they, on the books of the city, were seen as vacant lots in city lands. So um, they were always seen as lots that were up for, for, the gra for grabs. Um, the irony in this is that there are 11,000 other lots 
other than the gardens um, that the city owns that are vacant that could be used. And in fact, what had happened was the gardens in contributing to the vibrancy of neighborhoods that actually created the situation in which they were um, at risk of destruction because they, these neighborhoods had become such vibrant spaces. So this is just one performance that had happened in many of these theatrical events in which developers sort of raid a garden and stomp out all the flowers and, and these puppets which represent flowers sort of push them back out of the garden. Um, another great success was that at one point a judge issued an injunction because environmental impact statements were required on the development of all these sites and what he was saying was that the environmental impacts themselves did not take into account the fact that open space was being lost as soon as development took place. So that was a small victory as well and that stayed off development for another two years. So about half of the gardens are currently preserved and the movement continues today. Um, the second I'm going to take you to a much smaller place. Um, this is a town of 3,000 people, Nevada City, California. It's a small town in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains in Northern California. It was founded during the gold rush, uh, 1849, and rediscovered in the 70s by a lot of homesteaders, creative types, naturalists. In the late 2000s and 2010, um, a group started a volunteer organization called the Sustainability Team, and the mission of that group was to really bring forward the idea of economic, environmental, and social sustainability in this town to promote economic diversity and to keep this town alive. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of friction happening in the city. In 2011, City Hall, at one particular meeting, was packed with people, residents, um, community organizations, mem local business owners who were concerned about the fact that the city seemed to be a site for a lot of loitering of young teenagers, adults who would sort of hang out in the street um, for long periods of time, smoking, you know, doing other sort of unde quote, undesirable things. Um, the sustainability team saw that what was missing was actually positive social space. So the city had lost its main town square when a highway was cut through the center of town. And so people were essentially occupying public space because there was nowhere else to be. So they were occupying sidewalks and front streets and that sort of thing. So there was a lot of discussion around anti-loitering legislation. There was a lot of police attention to the issue. What the sustainability team did was they decided that they would approach it from a different um, perspective. Rather than trying to rid people of this essentially public space, they would create a better public space for everyone um, to participate in. And so what you see here is the creation of a boardwalk it was a wooden structure that was placed on. It took up three parking spaces on one particular block. Um, it was done with hours of volunteer time and a lot of donated materials. And it was put in place at first as a two-year pilot project. Over time, we started to see the change that was intended. So rather than streets being occupied by a small group of people, the diversity of people started to show up. So you had um, coffee shops. Uh, people spilling out from coffee shops, restaurants, and it really sort of expanded the social space of the city. It's now, in 2014, was renewed, and it's now been given another two years as a pilot project. The third uh, project I'm going to talk about just briefly is uh, an organization called the Municipal Art Society of New York City. It was founded in 1893, so it predates any zoning bylaw in North America, any preservation committee, um, and any other sort of formalized land use process. And the Municipal Arts Society also saw, saw a void in, in, um, in the environment around city planning. So they had, as an organization, worked on um, preservation law, on lots of land use <coughs> policy, the preservation of heritage buildings and open space. But what they saw was lacking was the ability for communities themselves to get engaged. So they started a project called the, Na the Livable Neighborhood Project. What they did was they created a toolkit. It's a fat binder that accompanies a one-day workshop. And what it is, is it's a free opportunity for people to come and learn about community planning. And it's everything from how to read a zoning bylaw, how to uh, pull census data so you understand your neighborhood, how to create an environmental impact statement. And the impetus for that was that in the early 1980s, New York City had created a situation uh, in which communities could create their own neighborhood plans. Planning department didn't have capacity to be planning all over the city. So they allowed for communities to create their own plans called 197A plans. Um, but com most communities did not have the capacity or the knowledge to um, allow them to do so. So with this livable neighborhoods program, the Municipal Arts Society was able to build capacity within organizations. You now have 11 community plans that are under implementation throughout New York City. And you have a growing number of people who, have under, who understand community planning and are participating more actively in the positive um, aspects of neighborhood planning. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.